Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this online uh, public meeting organised by uh, People Before Profit. So this uh, meeting is in relation to dying with dignity and legislation that has been put forward uh, by Gino Kenny uh, TD for People Before Profit. And so this meeting is to give people some information about the bill and to hear some stories uh, about um, personal stories about how people have been affected um, by this issue. So we have some really good speakers uh, here tonight. So first we have Gino Kenny TD who will talk about the bill itself. Uh, then we will hear from Gail O'Rourke. We will also hear from uh, Tom Curran and uh, Vicky Phelan will be joining us as well uh, later on. So uh, first of all, uh, I'll open the floor to Gino Kenny, who's a TD for People Before Profit, who has introduced legislation uh, to allow for assisted uh, dying in Ireland. So he'll talk a little bit about the bill. Um, so thanks everyone for watching and just to let people know before we start that um, we will be taking questions at the uh, at the end after the speakers. So just put it down in the comments below and we will read them out for the speakers to get back to you at the end. So uh, Gino. Thanks. Thanks, Madeline. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. Um, and just to say the last, I think, three weeks have almost been a kind of bit of a whirlwind. Um, it's kind of we started uh, three weeks ago in relation to the the launch of the of the bill itself, and I think overwhelmingly uh, the media coverage um, has been very very positive, um, and even even in relation to uh, my experience in the doll uh, with individual TDs, uh, you might you might obviously disagree with you a lot of other issues, but uh, there's you know I think it's been quite positive, much more positive than I thought. Uh, which is good. Uh, just in relation to the bill, this bill was introduced in 2015 by John Halligan uh, in late 2015, but it never went to second stage. The second stage is what happened last week. So it's a debate for a number of hours and then the vote, uh, which is tomorrow. But that never happened in 2015. So uh, the bill itself um, is essentially the same bill as 2015. Um, and it gives, makes provision and change to law in relation to somebody that has a terminal illness that is incurable, progressive, and will lead to uh, their debt. And it gives people a choice in relation to that, that kind of, I suppose, that stage of their illness. It's obviously a voluntary decision. Uh, nobody can be under duress by any means. Um, so that's the kind of the framework of of the bill itself uh, and that would be overseen by two medical practitioners would be completely independent of each other and that has to be uh kind of the, the declarate uh, have a declaration of a third person so there is a lot of um safeguards and regulations in relation to the issue as somebody of advanced age uh, a mental um disability of, of any kind or a disability would not um would not qualify in relation to this um, this law, so um, it's quite restrictive, and it's you know it's only in very very rare circumstances that somebody would avail of uh, of the law itself. Um, so that's the, the bill, um, and as I said, I think the response has been, uh, I think, very good, very very good. I think public opinion over the last number of years suggests that um, the public want to see um, change in relation to the law in relation to um, assisted dying and that's I think that's been kind of consistent now you know public opinion is one thing political opinion uh, and medical opinion is a completely different uh, matter but as I said from the outset I think political opinion has changed even in the debate uh, last week uh, you could see that you know, I think the majority of TDs from wherever we're party do agree that something needs to happen, right? Now, they might not agree with the bill, but they agree with the issue to a certain extent that something has to be uh, teased out because this obviously goes back to further than 2015. There was um, Marty Fleming's um, case in the Supreme Court uh, in 2013. Um, and then Bernard Fords and Gail Gail Rooks uh, court um, 
the situation with uh, the court in 2015. So there has been kind of cases where people wanted to avail of um, assisted dying, but obviously they couldn't. Uh, they had to go through the courts um, and some people had to go away. So, you know, this is not kind of sustainable and the law needs to be changed, in my opinion. Uh, so what will happen now is um, the debate was last week and a vote will take place tomorrow evening. Um, and that the, that vote will be uh, on the basis of the government's amendment. So the government have put an amendment to the bill stating that an all-party Oireachtas committee should be set up uh, for one year and they will look at all the kind of um, the elements of the issue. Um, and after one year, the bill that I've put forward can be read for a second time. Uh, but I, I take that with a pinch of salt. Uh, so in principle, we're not against the issue of scrutiny and bringing you know, all the witnesses from all the sides of this uh, debate in by, by any means. But what the amendment of the government amendment will do is sideline the bill completely. The bill will essentially kind of not see the light of day. Um, and that's the reason why, you know, we're kind of not supporting the amendment. We're supporting, you know, it should be uh, support vote on the bill itself. Because if the bill uh, was uh, successful tomorrow, as in um, you know, the majority of TDs voting for it, then it would go to a committee stage called pre-legislative scrutiny. So essentially what happens in that would happen in the all-party Oireachtas committee with kind of lesser time and it would give... I think with, to, a, to a lesser degree, a, a more of a commitment to, in relation to the bill and the issue itself. Uh, and at the end of that process, um, a report is issued uh, and a recommendation is given to uh, kind of the, 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 the TDs and so forth. What happens after that process, it's difficult to know. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of issues and a number of directions it could go. And I think there's three... But there's far away, there's far kind of directions. One is that there's legislative change, meaning that TDs change the law around assisted dying. Uh, that's one. Second one is that uh, a referendum takes place. So uh, it doesn't have to change the constitution, but it could be uh, like a, put, basically a referendum put to the people uh, to say, look, uh, uh, you know, do you agree with assisted dying or not agree to assisted dying and so forth? Kind of in the simplest term now a referendum in new zealand is happening in less than two weeks about that or the third um kind of route is that nothing ever happens and a report gathers dust and never sees the light of day so they're the kind of um the three routes that has gone down um it's difficult to know where it'll go i mean i know i i've said this to tom and gail and and vicky i really think in the last three weeks there's been a sea change in relation to this issue um uh and that's good that's good i think public opinion again and opinion in the kind of the kind of wider circles than kind of uh the, uh the public than the media um just certain you know obviously issues like this are very complex very complex they're not black and white by any means and people do evolve the right ideas evolve and people talk about these issues and they talk about these issues in their workplace, they talk about these issues in their kitchens, they talk about it in their kind of their car journeys, they talk to their friends, they talk to their wives, their husbands. So this has been talked about. And you know, people when they you know when the facts are put on the table in relation to this issue, I think there's a huge amount of empathy and compassion in relation to it. there's a huge amount of sympathy and there's a huge amount of rationale about uh, this issue. As I said it's it's very complex. Um and, you know, I think people are kind of teasing all this out. They do have concerns about certain things about, you know, about the issue. And that's absolutely fair enough. We try to address all that stuff. Uh, just in relation to everybody, you know, the opinions that we're hearing about, uh, we're hearing like from the medical community, you know, the political uh, kind of circle, uh, public opinion um, and all that. But I think the most important voice in all this debate is the patient. Is the person that finds themselves in that situation where they have terminal illness. And that is probably the most profound kind of situation anybody can find themselves in. And 
these, this would be done in very kind of in rare circumstances where somebody would avail of this uh, law, uh, and it's 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 voluntary. You know, it's not mandatory by any means, and they make that decision themselves uh, without you know fully kind of conversant uh, in relation to that, that kind of you know decision that they make. It's a very very difficult decision, but a uh, decision that they should be allowed to have. Uh, and again, it's not kind of an alternative to palliative care or hospice care by any means. That's not, you know, that's not what we're saying here. I think the person that's as I said fully kind of compassment should have a choice, should have a choice in relation to, uh, you know, on their terms um, in relation to the kind of control of their life. And that's what the bill is about without kind of the scaremongering. And some of the stuff that comes out uh, of some some of the other kind of opposition TDs, which is kind of, it hasn't been as bad as I thought it was going to be. But some of the stuff is quite like it's uh, it's horrible. I really, it's horrible. The conflating the issue of suicide and the issue of assisted dying is, it's, it, I just think it's un- absolutely unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. Because the person that does has the term is is not suicidal. Think about it; they're not suicidal. They don't want to die. You just don't want to die. They want to live every minute and every day and every week of their lives. But, you know, they're in a situation where, you know, it could be quite a painful ending and uh, they just want to be with their friends and their loved ones at that particular time at their on their terms. And that's, you know, the, the guts, that's the kind of the central part of the bill. So look at the, the debate will continue to go on. Uh, I think it's been a healthy debate. It's been kind of, a, res- a respectful debate uh, so far. Uh, I've been kind of taken aback by individual TDs by in different parties, uh, particularly in the government party, saying that look, uh, they support the issue, um, and that's 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 a good that's a good thing. So we'll see what happens tomorrow in the um, in the vote. Uh, I think it'll be very close. I think it'll be very close. But regardless, you know, whatever happens uh, tomorrow night. I think there's two things that we can kind of be kind of hopeful is that this issue is far from going away. In fact, I think it's gone from the periphery to the center kind of the, the center ground. And, um, you know, the debate will go on regardless of what, what happens um, uh, tomorrow night. And I, you know, I'll give my commitment and the party's commitment that, you know, um, we'll keep pushing this issue is, uh, until the law is changed. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gino, for that overview uh, of the bill. And you mentioned the the personal stories, and I suppose that's why uh, we have uh, Gail O'Rourke uh, here speaking to us tonight about her uh, own personal story uh, in relation to this subject and how she was taken to court for um, assisting uh, her her friend who was uh, in a in a very uh, sad uh, and terrible situations. So um, I'm going to let Gail talk uh, about her experience and uh, Gino's bill. So thank you, Gail, for coming and speaking to us. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks a million for having me on. I just agree with absolutely everything Gino has just discussed. It's, I suppose, the subject of dying with dignity was not something that was ever part of my life or my journey. It wasn't something that I was even aware of to be honest with you and I became very close friends with a girl um for many many years who was at the early stages of multiple sclerosis um back in 1998 we we became friends I became her cleaner and I knew she was unwell and then over time she was diagnosed with MS but in the background Bernadette Ford my friend had done her own research and her own homework on many aspects of the illness and also many aspects of what choices she would make to avoid the end that MS would bring her so she her illness progressed through the years of her friendship and I became her carer and then we were both involved in a very bad car crash in, in 2008 and one of the things Bernadette wanted to avoid was being put into a wheelchair but the crash put her into a wheelchair and she became very unwell after the crash so I suppose the plans that she had considered for a very long time and something that I suppose that she thought was you know far off in the future she was only 51 when she died 
And I suppose because of the crash and because of the wheelchair and because of the, I suppose, the speeding up of her illness, she started to put plans in place. And her plan was to go to Dignitas in Switzerland, where you can have assisted suicide, which is perfectly legal in their country. So for my friend Bernadette, it was always going to be, that was her get out of jail free card. She wasn't going to let MS take her all the way. And that was her right. That was her God-given right. So to avoid all of that, she was going to go to Zurich. Um, she didn't want to die. Bernadette loved life. She loved her family. She loved living. She had a great career. She loved holidays. She had a, she had a really, really good life. And the last thing Bernadette wanted to do would have been die. But this disease was going to push her closer to the point in life where you're not living. And in the last years of her life, particularly the last year of her life, she wasn't living. She was in constant pain. She had become an insomniac. So there was no sleep. There was no break. There was no reprieve from the pain or the anguish or the anxiety. Um, our final outing together was October 2010. And when she felt and witnessed the struggle of just even getting out for a few hours she had become incontinent which was something that she personally didn't want to um to experience and so our last outing was in October 2010 and I suppose over that Christmas she loved Christmas and she enjoyed Christmas and spent it with family and in January she starts to get the ball rolling for Zurich and um, so it was just a matter of contacting Dignitas in Zurich and getting that ball rolling get the provisional green light taking all their boxes and eventually setting a date. So this date was something that she she pushed away and pushed away until it suited her. In a, not suited her, that's a bad way of putting it, I suppose, but until the illness got to the stage where to travel to Switzerland to ingest the barbiturate or the liquid that they give you that you have to take yourself. So I suppose time was not something she had on her side. So she put the plans in place to go to Zurich. Um, she was travelling over with myself and her nephew. Logistically, she couldn't travel on her own, nor should she have to. So then the authorities were informed by the travel agent and I was arrested and we were told to cancel all plans. And after that, Bernadette, through devastation, anger, upset, pure frustration because the authorities, as far as she was concerned, shouldn't have intervened in her right to enter life in any country she chose. But they did what they did. So she went down a different route and she was always going to go down this route, one of the, whatever way she had. So she she contacted Exit International. She found a different route, a different option. And on the 5th of June 2011, Bernadette died um, after taking um, Nembutal. It's a barbiturate. But the problem is because it's illegal to be assisted and it's very strange the the level of assistance or the minimum level of assistance. I mean, it's since all of this happened that I realise now that even if she had got a taxi to the airport, I had informed the taxi driver where she was going to go to Zurich and why he was bringing her to the airport, that he too could have been prosecuted for assisting because he would have continued on the journey and brought her to the airport. So it's a very strange set of circumstances. So anyway, when Bernadette was to end her life, she had chosen a special day. She had family around she she people in, around her knew what she was doing but people couldn't be there so she had to put a very strict set of plans in place I was always supposed to be with Bernadette when she died in Zurich I was supposed to hold her hand and be with her when she died and and say goodbye and comfort her and give her the strength she needed and just be there as a human being but when Bernadette died in her apartment Bernadette died alone she died alone and she died absolutely terrified because she couldn't let anybody know what was going on. I had to go away. She sent me to Kilkenny with my husband. We couldn't be anywhere near her. And the most devastating thing in all of this, Bernadette's death was the most devastating thing, but her illness dictated that she died. Not, she wasn't suicidal. She loved life. But I think the hardest thing that in, in the fact that because there's no legislation, no openness, no honesty, it's all secrecy. It's all, hidden it's all hidden and Bernadette had to do everything on her own and the final thing that was the worst thing for anybody was the fact that she had to die on her own I couldn't be there she had to literally end her life on her own she couldn't have the comfort of her family she couldn't have the comfort of her friends she couldn't have anybody hold her hand she couldn't have anybody do anything for her at the very end and because her swallow was so bad she had to do what she did with the absolute fear 
that she may not be able to ingest what she wanted to ingest. And I think it's the cruelest of cruels to have anybody die alone. And I think in the lack of legislation, I just feel that this bill, this isn't for everybody. I don't even know if it's for me. I don't know what illness I will get or if I get an illness and I don't know what I will choose to do. But I think with Gino's bill and with legislation, it brings it out to the open. It brings these people who are terrified and scared and dying, it brings it out to the open so they can discuss it with dignity, with compassion. It gets people around them. It gets people there to comfort them. It brings the authorities in to ask the questions, to, to tick all the boxes, to make sure that they're not being pressured by family members or friends. or there's no. They talk about slippery slope and part of the slippery slope is people being put under pressure to end their lives. But this bill is so strict and so stringent with the two unconnected physicians who will be there. I just feel that if this law and the legislation had been brought forward, Bernadette would have had a much much easier journey and a much more peaceful journey towards what she was going to do anyway, whether legislation existed or not. And I just feel that that this bill is is exactly what we all need. It's not mandatory. It's not. It's just a choice. And we have so many choices. And I have had nothing but good feedback about this. I haven't had anybody say it shouldn't be a choice. And the only negative things I do see is the scaremongering coming from one organization who will remain nameless and one politician I saw on Eruptus TV the other day who spoke in a way to terrify people who he said that once you're, you turn 80, that it will be forced to euthanasia, that it's going to be pressuring people who don't want to die and who aren't terminally ill, who are in inconvenience. And it just, it upsets me so much that he can be so flippant and that these words may linger in people's ears and it's not fair because that's not the fact. And then there's talk of a slippery slope in countries where this exists already. And there's no proof of a slippery slope. And I know Tom Curran will be able to talk more about that. But that's my personal aspect. And I just feel that this legislation needs to be brought forward so the people who want to die and choose to die in a dignified way have that right. So hopefully this bill will pass. Thank you so much, uh, Gail, for speaking to us. And um, I think there's there's nothing like hearing those kind of stories for to make people understand what this is really about and uh, so i want to thank you for telling your story telling bernadette's story um to allow people to to actually understand what this issue means to people like you and what it what it would have meant for someone like Bern bernadette in the situation that she was in so uh, I'm going to now bring in uh, Tom Curran. So people might know uh, Tom as Marie Fleming's uh, partner. Uh, Marie uh, took a, a case uh, through the courts uh, in relation to this issue. Um, so uh, hopefully Tom will speak a little bit about that. Tom is also director of Exit International, uh, the organisation that uh, Gail uh, mentioned there. So um, I'm going to give uh, Tom about 10 minutes or so uh, to speak. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for, for being here with us. Thank you for inviting me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I've a bit of a lump in my throat hearing Gail talk because it brings back so many memories. Uh, just like Gail, I suppose I got involved in this having never come across the topic of the right to die at all. Uh, and again, Mary, my partner, had MS. And her, as her MS progressed, she decided that uh, she wasn't going to let it take control of her death. And it, it was fairly simple that there was no question or doubt about it. She, she wanted to be in control of her own death. She didn't want a bad death. She wanted to live. Uh, just like Bernadette, we arranged to go to Dignitas at one stage. But Mary wasn't ready to die. The reason that Mary was going to Dignitas was her swallow was disappearing. And the only method that was available in Switzerland at the time, it has changed thanks to the work of Exit International as well. It has changed now that they, that they will use a cannula that the person doesn't have to swallow. Not, not Dignitas, but others, other clinics. Uh, we arranged to go to Dignitas, but Mary didn't want to die at that time. So this is how I came across Exit International. We put a plan in place ourselves that Mary could die at home. And I had always given her the assurance that I would help her uh, because Mary's MS had progressed to the point where she couldn't help herself. Uh, that was completely illegal. And this is one of the reasons why this bill is so important. Uh, Mary did eventually die after taking the court case, which I'll talk about in a minute. She died in our cottage where I'm sitting now in, in the Wicklow Hills, 
uh, peacefully in my arms. Uh, sorry. The court case that we took was largely for everybody else. Because while Mary knew that she had the option herself and she had the assurance that I would help her at any time, irrespective of what the law was, uh, we wanted to make sure that, 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 that this was something that was available to other people like Mary. So it was the court case, while it, it was taken by Mary, and Mary challenged the constitutionality of, of the 1993 Suicide Act, which made it illegal to help someone do something which is legal. Suicide is perfectly legal, uh, but it's, a, it's a, a crime to assist a person to do something that's legal. It's the only crime, it's the only thing on the statute books in any country in the world where it's illegal to help someone do something legal. But that's neither here nor there. We, we challenged, the, or we took the challenge on, the, on two counts. One was that Mary's autonomy, Mary should have the right to decide for herself. The constitution guarantees a person a right to life and we felt that that gave the person a right to die as well. Uh, the second was discrimination. That we, while suicide is perfectly legal, any rational person has a legal right to take their own life. And we established that in the court. But if a person's disability prevented them from doing that, then they would be discriminated against. The Supreme Court upheld that on the basis that, yes, Marty was discriminated against by the law, but they weren't prepared to strike out the law. They put it back to the Oireachtas for the law to be changed. And they made the ruling that there was nothing in the constitution to prevent the Oireachtas from, from bringing in a law to allow people to die. And that, that is where the original bill came from. I drafted the bill with the help of four barristers. Uh, four barristers gave their time for free. Uh, and we drafted the bill which John Halligan put in, but that bill went nowhere. The, the bill that's in the before the doll now is very, very similar to that. In fact, it's almost word for word the same. But it's now been resurrected, and by the, by the looks of things, it's gone a lot further. Uh, I suppose one of the things that, that comes to mind is we're all going to die. You know, none of us are going to get out of this life alive. None of us. We're all going to die at some stage or other. But very few of us have any understanding of how we're going to die. Uh, lots of people don't want to know. It's so, dying is something that very few people are prepared to talk about. But there is a substantial number of people here in Ireland and in every country in the world that have some idea that their death is not going to be very pleasant. That they are, they're facing a prolonged, possibly painful and drawn out death. And these are the people with, with illnesses. These are the people with, with terminal or not necessarily terminal illnesses, but long term disabilities that are progressive. And they know that in almost all cases, they are going to be facing a very difficult and very distressing death. And this is what this bill is about. It's to give them choice. They have the choice of palliative care, even though it's not that great in Ireland. Uh, I, I'm personally involved in the palliative care movement because my view is that a person has the right to live just as much as they have. And well, they have the right to live, but they should have that right to die as well. But if a person wants to live, they should be given every possible help and every possible medical help to do that, but if a person wants to die, they should also be given help to do that. Uh, I got, I stayed involved after Marty died seven years ago, and as I say, or as was said already, I'm now a director of Exit International. I've represented the right to die on, I thought, is it five continents and in more countries that I can think of. Even just last Saturday, we had uh, a Zoom to four and a half thousand people about methods of ending one's life. I'm also part of an organization called Mutech, which develops and researches methods to help people to take their own life. In the absence of a law, that's the only option that's available to people. It's not legal, but it's the only option that's available to people. Uh, and I will continue to do that because I do feel that even the laws, when they're brought in, are very restrictive. In fact, I wonder, with this bill, would Mary or Bernadette have qualified? Because, for instance, uh, it is very likely that there will be a time scale put in the bill. There'll be an amendment to say that a person has to be within a certain time of death or that death is imminent within a certain period of time. And no neurologist is prepared to give that length of time for a person with MS. So they may not qualify. In the world itself, there are, I suppose, two, two movements 
on the right to die. There, there's one which are very much involved in changing the law, organisations like Dignity and Dying in the UK and here, and they want the law changed. And there are organisations like ourselves that what we do is we provide information so that they can take that, uh, I suppose, step into their own hands and they, they can plan their own situation well in advance. And this is one of the things that this bill really helps people with. People, people in most cases don't want to die. They want to live, but they want to know that they won't have a bad death. And as with Mary, Mary put her plan in place five, six years before she died. And once we put that plan in place, Mary relaxed and got on with living. It was her insurance policy that she wasn't going to have a bad death. So she didn't need to worry about that anymore. Any stage when she felt that she would that she had had enough, she knew that she had that out. And she just and we both got on with living. And by putting that plan in place, which this bill would give for some people, by putting that plan in place, I got an extra five years of Mary in my life because she didn't travel to Dignitas. And that's why this bill is so important to that small number of people that are facing bad debts. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Tom, for, for telling your story. And uh, I think a lot of people would have heard about um, you and Mary, but uh, it's always interesting to hear it from from uh, first hand perspective and uh, and the kind of work that you've been uh, you've been doing in Exit International is, is very interesting to hear about as well so um I know that Vicky Phelan was here um and I think she went to park her car so uh, I'm not sure if she's she's back yet um is Vicky there I don't think so well maybe she yes, is here I am yep you are great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. So, hi, Vicky. Thank you so hi. much uh, for That's for speaking all. to us. I turn on the light uh, here now. Sorry, I'm in the car. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's no problem at all. Uh, thank you for making it. So, um, I'm sure Vicky Phelan doesn't need any introduction. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows of Vicky and uh, her bravery uh, over the past few years. Um, so, uh, I suppose what people probably would be interested in hearing is, Vicky, why have you come out publicly to support uh, this legislation and talking openly about this issue? Um, hi, Tom. Hi, Gail. Uh, Gina, is that you up in the corner? I can just about see you. How are you guys? Um, I've thought about this a lot um, over, obviously, over the last two and a half years since I became uh, terminally ill. But I actually remember watching Mary Fleming's case uh, back in 2013, wasn't it, Tom? Was it 2013? Yep. Yeah. And I was drawn to it at the time because I thought it was cruel what, what was happening and, and I thought you know how are we not allowing a woman like this to make that decision about her own life so that was probably the first time I really thought very seriously about it um, I probably would have thought about it uh, a long time ago I had a very bad car accident about 26 years ago and one of my friends was very badly severely paralyzed um, and she would have had you know thoughts um at the time as well about if her life got worse and uh, you know because she was paralyzed from the neck down so she had very little use of her hands so it's something that I suppose I've been thinking about for a long long time but you know it, it now applies to me um so it's very personal and you know I've had two and a half years really to think about this and for me I've got two young children um I know uh, this particular cancer that I have cervical cancer uh, you know there's a lot of complications at the end and women uh, can can end up you know in an awful lot of pain um, and uh, a lot of suffering and you know palliative care is excellent uh, we're very lucky in this country you know that it is very good but there are times when they can't get on top of all the pain uh, and I don't want that for me and I don't want that for my children and it's not like that I want to die you know I often you know a few people have contacted me since I came out and spoke about this and said you know why do you want to die and I just don't understand that I mean people obviously don't know anything about me when they say that because like if a cure came tomorrow I'd jump at it do you know what I mean I don't want to die but the reality is I'm being practical I know that this cancer is not curable there will come a time when the treatments will stop working and I'm going to die and I want to be able to die on my own terms and control the circumstances of my death the same way I've controlled my life. 
yeah thanks thanks vicky and and i don't know um if you might say something about this vicky do you do you think that um popular i suppose opinion about this issue has changed over the last uh, of last period uh, in this country in particular I think so. I, 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 you know, we've had this chat a few times, um, myself and Gino and, and Tom and Gail, the last time I met them up in Dublin. And Tom, I know you said you think that the public opinion has definitely changed since, you know, uh, Mary's case uh, seven years ago or six years ago. Um, and I certainly feel, I thought I was actually going to get an awful lot more uh, trolling and a lot of you know, people contacting me, telling me um, that, you know, what I was doing was wrong. And actually, I've got very little of that. I've been very surprised. Um, I do, you know, I have had a lot of posts from people, um, uh, you know, who have very strong religious beliefs, who have sent me miraculous medals and said they're praying for me and, you know, wish that I wouldn't, uh, you know, wish that I would change my mind. And you know what? I respect that. I respect that people have very strong religious beliefs. But my thing about this is you know it's about choice you know I wouldn't choose for somebody else you know how to end their life so you know don't I, I you know I would hope that people would respect my wishes about how I want to end mine you know I don't have those strong religious beliefs and this is what I want to do with 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 the you know with my death for me and for my children and what will work for me well, thanks Vicky if I could yeah, just Tom, say something, go ahead. Because, uh, I suppose the whole situation about uh, Mary's plan came out many years before uh, before we took the court case. It, in fact, it, it, it appeared on the front page of the, the Mail on Sunday uh, from a reporter that I spoke to, not realising that it was a reporter. Uh, oh. And the headline of the Mail on Sunday was, I will kill my wife. Uh, but... <laughs> So, and that started a guard investigation into, into us as well. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But when that broke, the amount of abuse that I got from people was horrendous. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one person spit in my face uh, walking down the street in our club. Yeah. Uh, and, but the, the change that's come about, particularly with people like yourself, Vicky, and like yourself, Gail, of giving a human face to this, you know, it, it, that's what's needed for people to see. And when Mary came out, when Mary was going through that court case, the, the empathy, and I won't say sympathy because Mary didn't want sympathy, but the empathy mm. she got for her, for what she wanted to do was tremendous. And that got people thinking. And since then, I think there's a huge sway in support for this. I've had absolutely no uh, abuse this time. In fact, I've got loads and loads of support and, for, and from people saying that it's about time. But the change has been enormous in that 10 years. Oh, wow. Well, that's that's good to hear, um, Tom. That's really good to hear. You're muted, Gail. Hold on. There, you're, you're okay now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Am I back? Yeah, and I just remember when I was going through my trial, Tom, like you were the biggest support, my my rock, my third two place. And I remember you talking to me about when you were going through your I, journey I'll with Mary. Two, two minutes, guys. And the venom. Okay. The, the venom. The venom that people showed you, Tom, and the, the negativity. And I remember you saying to me one time when we met up, so how has it been? How much negativity have you got? And I said to you, I haven't had one. I remember because it's so funny when you when you end up in this situation obviously your name is printed in the paper and I know you're all familiar with that but letters find their way to you without your address just your name and Tala and they find their way to you and the only thing that I got that was in any way and it wasn't negative it was a very supportive but again it came from a religious place and it just included some little cutouts of how to repent for my sins um but I just remember that you talking about the tidal wave of negativity and you were very happy and relieved and surprised that I didn't and I think, again, that, that was five years ago that I was acquitted from my trial. And I think that Vicky, again, I think that trickle-down effect and Vicky being Vicky, coming from where she's coming from and what she's already been through, I think that she... I think it's just every time another cog turns in this machine, the machine moves forward in a much more dignified and open, openly discussed way. And it's just such a relief and such a pleasure. In a Pleasure is not the right word, but just to see it being moved forward and how much it has changed since your time, Tom. It's just nice to see. 
just to maybe follow on from that, I'm keeping kind of an eye on uh, the comments that are coming in and stuff. And th there's m mainly very supportive comments actually um, on the video here, which is which is great, really good. Uh, and there isn't really a lot of questions. So I, I'll just say again to people who are watching, if there's anyone who has a question, uh, please feel free to just put it in the comments and uh, and uh, I'll read it out to the people here. But maybe I'll, I'll ask Gino in the meantime, maybe uh, do you, what do you think about public perception at the moment and do you feel the same as uh, as Gail and uh, and Tom have been saying around the change of opinions uh, lately? It's a good Gino, you're yeah. muted. Yeah. Can you hear me? You're yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's very very interesting. Like if you look at the commentary. Um, in the last four weeks when, well, four or five weeks when this kind of issue kind of started getting kind of more kind of national notice. I think the, the coverage has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and there's been kind of uh, commentary from, as I said, from all aspects, doctors, um, uh, just, just, you know, just the media itself. So I think overwhelmingly it's been positive. Um, I think a lot has changed in the last 10 years in Ireland because of uh, the issue around kind of the, the big kind of social kind of changes that we've had in Ireland around kind of marriage equality and the right to choose. And I think because of that, uh, people are more kind of, I think, open and they're more kind of, and listen to the rationale about the situation uh, in relation to this issue. I think, if I, like if 20 years ago, I think we couldn't even have this debate. It just wouldn't happen. Uh, and even 10 years ago, I think it would have been very, very, very fraught uh, indeed. But uh, I think it's changed. Um, Ireland has changed. And hopefully the law will change uh, come, uh, you know, the future. Um, but the, the, the public always, the public are always ahead of politicians in this. Mm. Always ahead. And if you look at just... You just gauge the, the opinion of the public and just the average person. When you just tell them the rationale about, you know, a, a situation uh, of a person that wants to choose this, you know, avail of this law, the vast majority of people will say, look, if they want to choose to do that, that's up to them. Who am I to say to stop them? You know, who am I? Like, if they want to do that and it's legal and it's medically, you know, ethically correct for them but in order to do that the law has to change uh, it's like a lot of things um because if the law is not ha does, doesn't change then you will have situations where happen to baronet and marry so that's why it's important with the bill um that you know it, it progresses to the next stage of the, the process and it the process will be long it's not going to be done overnight you know it's going to be it's quite long but i think things have changed I think dramatically in the last four weeks. I mean, if you think about it, um, the vote will be tomorrow night, um, and I, I don't really know what the outcome will be. But wherever the outcome is, uh, this issue has significantly progressed. Significantly progressed. What the end process is, uh, I I don't know, but I, I I'm quite optimistic that something will happen. I really do. I really I really feel something will happen at the end of this process and hopefully the law will change around people availing of voluntary assisted dying and i've said this to vicky earlier on because there's all sorts of terminology that people will use which is pretty horrible uh, but think about it voluntary assisted dying is it's a it's a decision completely made by the person right it's assisted you have to do it you know yourself and medically and it's dying and, you know, that's the reality. People are in a situation where they have a terminus that's coming to the end of their life and they are dying. And they should have uh, the right to end their own life in their own terms with their friends, with their friends and family. And that's the, that's the fundamental, I suppose, the nucleus of the bill. Uh, and other jurisdictions across the world, uh, it has ha it, it happened. Um, and there's no slippery stuff. There's no evidence at all where the situation has, you know, you know, where people are coerced, where there's kind of, you know, there's kind of these, you know, relatives behind them saying, look, you have to die. You know, 
this board and society people are being lined up to die it's just it's just scaremongering it's really horrible um but all that, that has to be teased out and people that are entitled to our opinions for religious reasons all sorts of reasons i fundamentally disagree with some people what they say but i have like i have to listen and um, but you know that's the part of the process uh of this issue it's quite it's complex you know it's profound it's difficult it's diff it's very it's, it's very difficult to even speak wherever side you're on you know wherever side you're on but i think if we're respectable to each other's opinions i think this this debate will continue in the right direction Gino, can I? Sorry. Sorry, I'll get. I'll get you. Just, I have a question here okay. from someone. So I better just. It's about the vote and discussion tomorrow. So Janie Lazar is uh, asking, can we listen in to the discussion and vote tomorrow? Gino, is that going to be on a Rockdus TV? Yeah, it'll be on a Rockdus TV. There's no discussion. So there's, there's, a, there's, there will be at least two votes, if not three. So the fourth vote will be on the government's amendment. So the first vote, it'll be in the convention centre. You can watch it live. It'll be on about, I think about, it starts about half nine. This is kind of a series of votes for different issues. So I think um, the first vote will be on the amendment. If that's successful, then there is a second vote on the amended motion, if that makes sense. So it basically, it's a vote um, for the amendment to, to pass. If the amendment is unsuccessful, then the government amendment falls, and then there is a vote on the bill. Um, and I, I really don't know how it will go, you know. Uh, but I think if it comes down to the bill, it will pass. I don't see how the government could vote against it. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. Um, and it's a free vote. Remember, it's this is this is where it gets very interesting. We've obviously called for a vote of conscience, a free vote. That means that the parties of government, the three parties, we're calling on their, I think they've granted an individual vote for each of their TDs. Now, whether they vote on block, they could. They could just vote all for the amendments. And that's if, they, if that happens, then the amendment is successful. If certain TDs, you could have a situation where TD is from possibly one of the parties, possibly Fianna Fáil, votes against the amendment for different reasons than us uh, and votes against our bill. So you could have that situation or you could have members of each of them three parties voting against the amendment but voting for our bill because, you know, because we put a case uh, that the bill you know, should progress to committee stage rather than having an all-party committee, which just, I think, delays the whole, you know, the, the debate. So... So there are all the complexities, if um, if that makes any sense. Thanks, Gino. I think it's good for people just to know uh, what's happening tomorrow. So I saw both Gail and Tom wanted to come in. So Gail, I'll, I'll bring you in first there. Yeah, I just want to make a point in relation to legislation and people's fears. In the absence of legislation, um, for example, in my, own, in my own situation, because Bernadette had to do everything secretly and not out in the open, if there had have been anybody in her life putting pressure on her, if I had have been a bad person, if I had have had a lot to gain by Bernadette's death, then there was nobody to check that. So in the absence of legislation, people can do the things that people fear them doing when it comes to forcing somebody or pushing somebody towards a death. Whereas after Bernadette died and the investigation began, there was there were so many questions to be answered and she wasn't there to answer them. The only person who could answer these questions was myself, because mainly every day myself and Bernadette were the ones who were together all the time. So there wasn't anybody else. Um, I suppose because it's such a taboo subject as well, people in her life weren't around her as much as they wanted to be, or maybe as much as they could have been, because it was such a sensitive subject, it wasn't being discussed. So that desensitization didn't get to happen. But if legislation did exist, social workers, guards, I mean, you name it, anybody who wants to come in could come in and ask all those questions that need to be asked prior to the person's death to sit down one on one with all the authorities and answer those questions. So I think it's safer to have the legislation in place because I think that it takes away that dark, quiet place where people who can manipulate people in a weakened condition 
can get away with that manipulation. So it's just I want to put, I want to make that point. Thanks, Gail. It's a good point. So, uh, Tom, did you want to come in there as well? It, it was just a, a bit of clarification that that, that in, when I was speaking, I said that suicide was perfectly legal and a person had a legal right to take their own life. Uh, but one of the things that I'm quite often asked is if that's the case, why does why is assistance needed? So I really just wanted to, cl to clarify that because this bill is all about getting over the, the, the part of the 1993 Act that makes it illegal to assist someone. And there are two basic reasons why assistance is required. Uh, the first is that a means for a peaceful death is not readily available to everybody. Uh, it's not something that, mm -hmm. that, that people can lay their hands on very easily. And it, in most cases, the only legal access to a peaceful death is through the medical profession. Now, that, that there are other situations where that doesn't apply, but we won't go into those here. But that's the main, that's one of the reasons that the legal or the, 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 the medical profession have the monopoly on providing a peaceful death. They, ha they, ha they control the substances that are available. Uh, and the second part of that is that when a person's disability gets to the point where they can't do something for themselves, then they need the assistance. So but, but by, by not having that assistance there, what we're forcing people to do, and what happens in an awful lot of cases with, say, with, with people going to Switzerland, is that they go too early. They go before they want to, while they can still travel, while they can still swallow. Uh, and that was one of the things that I fought very strongly for, was to get over this thing of a swallow. Because a lot of people, their swallow goes, particularly if they have a neurological problem. So now what, what we've developed with, with, an organ, with one of the organizations out in Switzerland is the ability for a doctor to put in a cannula and apply the Nembutal through a drip. And the person that's dying initiates the flow of that drip. And if, if they're completely paralyzed, they can do it by blinking their eyes. They, they, can, they can do it with touch if they can move anything in their body. They can do it with their tongue. But they can also, as I said, do it with a blink, with a blink of an eye with, with electronically. So that gets over the problem of, in Switzerland, the person has to initiate the death themselves. It's suicide. It's not a euthanasia. Euthanasia is illegal in Switzerland. So to get over that problem of a person swallow and the administering of the Nembutal, uh, there are electronic means available. Thanks, Tom. That's that's uh, really useful. Um, now, there is a question here. So Gina might take this from John O'Connor, who asks, uh, what will happen if it doesn't uh, go through tomorrow or if there's a vote against it? What what happens then? Against it. So what will happen, hypothetically, if the bill is voted against, then um, what will happen, the amendment will be successful and then there's what the amendment says that an all party joint Eroctus um, committee should be set up. Um, and that would be for a one year time frame. And that will be uh, chaired by an independent TD, or not an independent TD, but a, t a TD. Um, and what happens there, there would be a, probably a public representative TD from each of the parties. Now anybody can go as a public representative um, and that will call in witnesses from the whole broad spectrum in relation to the issue. So you'd have doctors, uh, you know, members of this, you know, patients, alliance, you know, you had, every, had everybody really, you had everybody kind of um, from the whole spectrum. Um, and at the end of that process, a report then is issued um, and that gives its recommendation recommendations to uh, the doll. Now what that will be after a year it's difficult to know. Uh, mm. There is a stipulation in, in, the, in the, the amendment that the bill that I, we had debated last week would be um, would be debated again and given a free vote. But again I take that with a slight pinch of salt. And um, I think there's every chance that the bill would not be read for a second time. Um, so, what what happens at the end of that process? Yeah, that's it'd be a bit similar to uh, the the committee that was set up around um, the Eighth Amendment. Similar to that. 
So that went on, that committee went on for about nine months. Um, yeah, can I ask Gino, can I ask a question, Gino, about that committee? Yeah. Like the committee for around the Eighth Amendment um, only sat for like an eight or nine month period. Yeah. Where do they come up with a 12 month period for this one? I don't know. I think it was just, I think Fine Gael kind of came okay. up with that idea. So, you know, they gave her one year. Okay. Uh, what uh, they said that it will start. Um, it will begin almost immediately, so it could mm. begin maybe in November, uh, and then if you have one year, um, how, how many times it meets per week? I'm not sure. It'll probably meet on if I say a fortnightly basis. Um, okay. So it'd be quite long, uh, and I said they would bring witnesses from everywhere, literally everywhere. Looking at different models, diff looking at different jurisdictions where it's happened. Uh, so hopefully it would be balanced, and hopefully at the end of that process they could make recommendations that you know, yeah, it's up to us to legislate, or they could say, uh, I mean, it could ask the Sins Assembly. They could say, look, at, we could have should have a referendum on the issue in six months. That's a possibility. Um, so there's there's a lot of routes that it could go down. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Gino. Uh, that's useful. There is a comment here that I thought might be useful. I don't know uh, if, if any of you have any knowledge about this, but uh, as Gino said uh, earlier, there is going to be a referendum in New Zealand, um, and uh, someone here says that they've had a very long, active, long campaign for end of life choice, as they call it, which is uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and there is and will be a wealth of experience for us to draw on from there. I don't know if anyone, any of you uh, have looked at what's happening in New Zealand and the debates that are happening there. I, I've spent a lot of time out there with them. And in fact, I was supposed to be out there now on, on the campaign trail. I, I, know, I know the people in New Zealand very well and I work with them. Yeah. I think all the indications, Madeline says, that two towards the majority will vote in favour. Yes. Yeah, that's what it looks like. You know? And that's, I mean, the history of that, you know, issue in New Zealand is quite long, really, really long. Yeah. Uh, it's only the last, I think the it's last four or years. five years. Yeah, the last four or five years. And there yes. was months previous, previous years and it never really went anywhere. But the last four years now, it's it's culminated in, um, in the referendum. Yeah. I think it will probably be interesting for us. Obviously, um, we'll see what happens tomorrow. But uh, the most likely scenario, I think, is the the amendment, the government's amendment, and the committee that Gina was talking about. And it will probably be interesting for us then to to look at uh, what's ha what 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 happens in New Zealand. Obviously, the outcome of the referendum, um, and then look at what what the campaigners have been doing uh, there as well, because there will be obviously if if it goes to the committee there'll be some work to do for for us i suppose um to make sure that that this doesn't get stuck in that committee or that the bill doesn't get buried or uh, or anything like that that the issue is progressed uh, as quick as uh, as possible so uh, I, I i don't have any other kind of uh, questions in particular here so uh, I suppose um, before we finish I suppose I want to say if, if anyone uh, has anything else that they'd like to add uh, to the discussion at this stage um, I suppose you know if, I, if, if there are people tuning in who are on, still on the fence and who don't know you know who really feel uncomfortable about this bill you know i would just ask you to put yourselves in my shoes um uh, or somebody who is like me terminally ill particularly you know somebody who's young with young children and just imagine what my life is like you know on a daily basis you know worrying about when my time comes and worrying about my children you know and worrying about them seeing me dying um and hearing that you know very specific sound of dying the death rattle which, you know, it will be unnecessary for my children to hear and to have as a memory. Um, when I can have a choice, you know, I'm, I'm going to be at a stage where there's no coming back from this disease. It's not that I want to die. I just want to die peacefully on my own terms and be able to say goodbye to my family and my children and my friends before I am in intolerable pain. And I don't think that's too much to ask, to be honest, for any of us um, if we're in the same condition. 
Thank you, Vicky, for that's very uh, moving uh, to hear to hear you make that kind of uh, plea, I suppose, to, to, to people, uh, to the public um, out there. So um, do any of, uh, of, of you others want to add anything before we uh, we'll wrap this up? Well, the only thing that I'd like to say is that uh, if it does go down the route that Gino seems to be pretty certain it will do and it goes to a committee, then we will need to start uh, some sort of campaign. So if there's anybody out there that, that would like to help or get involved in that, please contact you and we, we, we'll organize. That, that will need to be done to put pressure on uh, that committee to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And I think if it does go to that stage and it, it, the, the government amendment goes through, um, Gino, I think it would be very important that patient voices are heard from um, at yes. that committee, because, you know, one of the things that I think has been very lacking from some of the position papers I've seen from uh, the RCPI and the um, Irish Palliative Care Association, you know, is and I've asked a couple of the doctors when I was put up against them, uh, you know, in interviews, you know, did any of them consult patients? No, they didn't. They consulted their members who are doctors. But at the end of the day, you know, it's the patient's wishes and the patient's choices that should also be included in any consideration of a position paper on assisted dying. So that's one thing I certainly would be looking for um, if this goes to a special committee. Well said. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I think if there are people out there watching who want to get involved, um, maybe get in touch with, uh, with, with Gino Kenny's Facebook page. If you're watching there, uh, just send us a message and, uh, and we'll get back to you when, when we'll probably be doing some organizing, obviously, then in, in the next, um, over the next period, uh, whatever way we can organise during these uh, these uh, times, but uh, we will obviously do whatever we can um, to to get people uh, involved as much as possible. And um, so, I really want to thank uh, all all of you for speaking tonight. It's been very very useful to uh, to hear your voices. Uh, so, thanks to Gail O'Rourke, to Vicky Phelan, to Tom Kern, uh, and of course to to Gino Kenny for. Uh, putting this bill forward in the first place and uh, and raising the issue uh, and making sure that uh, that something uh, will will change in this country um, uh, hopefully in the near future uh, so thank you everyone uh, for for attending everyone for watching um, and uh, and we'll we'll keep fighting and Gino Kenny will have an update tomorrow uh, Gino you'll put an update on your Facebook page to let yeah. people know what happens with the vote tomorrow as well. Yeah, I'll maybe make a short video prior to the, the vote, but the vote will be about, I say, about quarter to ten, ten o'clock. Okay. Um, and I still, yeah, look, we'll see what happens. But wherever it happens, I think there's, it's been, uh, the last four or five weeks have, you know, has been hugely significant in relation to this issue. And I think they'll look back, this has been the catalyst for legislative change around assisted uh, dying in Ireland. Yeah. Thanks to Great. Tom. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very yeah, much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.